This is the talk, Inclusive Design, Think and Beyond Accessibility. I'm your presenter, Mike Miles. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm excited to be part of WP Campus 2021. So before we get into this topic, I just want to give you a little bit of background on myself. Again, my name is Mike Miles. I've been working professionally as a web developer since 2004, um, and I've been working since 2008 uh, with exclusively PHP frameworks such as WordPress. In my day job, I am the director of web development for MIT Sloan, where my team and I are responsible for the web presence of MIT Sloan and how we reach current and future business leaders. Uh, our main website is mitsloan.mit.edu. So if you see any technical problems with that website, it's my responsibility to fix them. Uh, in my free time, I have a podcast called Developing Up, where we focus on topics uh, about develop building a development career that are not about writing code. So anything that's about building your career as a developer, but not about writing code is what we cover. If you want to know anything more about me, you can find me all over the internet with the handle MikeMiles86 on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on GitHub, uh, places such as that. So feel free to reach out. I want to start the talk today making a, a, a statement about one thing I believe we all here have in common. And that's not that we're WordPress developers. That's not that we work at higher ed institutions. Those are just the given gave based on our conference. But the one thing I believe we all have in common is that we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. As developers, I believe we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. I hope you agree with the statement because in my experience, developers are problem solvers. They want to solve a problem and produce something valuable. I have never met a developer who wakes up in the morning and thinks, well, how can I make things worse for a user? Right? We all want to make things better. We want to make a positive impact. And this is important for this talk and for being considering this subject because making a positive impact on many people as possible is about reaching as many people as possible. It's about being as inclusive for as many people as possible. And that's why this talk is titled Inclusive Design Thinking Beyond Accessibility because over the last couple of years, a lot of us have really paid more and more attention to the accessibility needs of our users, which is very great, very fundamental. And when I talk about accessibility needs, what I mean is the differences in our users for their vision, vision their hearing, their cognitive ability, and their mobility, uh, the ability to use a keyboard or a mouse. Again, these are very important things to pay attention to when we're writing code, especially for our WordPress sites and how we deliver our content to our end users. However, humans differ in many different ways than just these. And the, the differences that every human has impacts how they experience the web. What other differences am I talking about? Things such as location, gender, language, education, age, all these differences and many, many more alter how someone interacts with the web, alters how someone interacts with our WordPress websites, and all plays a part on how we can make a positive impact on them. So inclusive design is about thinking beyond just those accessibility needs of our users, but what other differences do we need to take into account and that we should work towards pro providing support for to make the web as usable, to make our projects as usable, our, our websites as usable to as many people as possible. Now, when I first started thinking about inclusive design and, and working in, with this inclusive design, I came up with what I consider four pillars for inclusive mindset. These are four ideas for developers. I believe if we follow on our projects, we can more inherently build a inclusive project, inclusive products for our end users. So what are these four pillars? Number one, no user is average. Number two, every user deserves equal access. Number three, that we provide understandable content for every user. And the fourth pillar, that every user deserves our trust and respect. These are four things that I try to apply in my projects and that I want to talk about for the rest of this talk. I want to go through each one of these. And I hope by the end of it, you as a developer in the higher ed space, in the WordPress space, can find at least one of these pillars useful to you to make your project more inclusive and make a bigger positive impact on more people. So let's go through them. No user is average. If we believe that no user is average, then we have to throw out the assumption that we can take tons of different metrics and data about our users, average it all together, and, and build that one perfect user that we're going to build for, that one use case that we're going to build for. We're going to understand that there is no one user that falls into that and that we have to take into account the differences our users have in the real world and how they interact with our products. 
there's a talk out there, uh, a TED Talk by Todd Rose called The Myth of Average, which I really enjoy. It came out a number of years ago. I have a bit.ly link here to it. Bitly, IDX, AVG, Myth. I'll have all my bit.ly links at the end of this presentation. But in it, Todd says that if you design for the average, you are literally designing for nobody. If you think about this for a second, it makes sense, especially on the web, right? If we're taking average metrics on how user interacts with our projects, uh, their connection speeds, you know, their ability to use a computer, we make an average user. There's not one actual person that meets those averages. That average user does not exist because every single person who interacts with our online products differs from that average. So we think about this. If we, if we design for the average, like Todd Rose says, we literally build for nobody. We design for nobody. So from how we design our WordPress websites to how we implement our WordPress plugins, we have to get rid of this idea of average and start thinking about well, what are the actual differences we experience with our users. We have to think about this across the whole lifespan of our project and in our implementation of our tickets and, and our features and functionality. One way to do this in our teams is to create personas with limitations for everything we do. Now, a persona, for those of you who might not be familiar, is the idea of putting a fake name and face and story for a fake user for to, to cover a range of users that we want to build for. You know, in higher ed, this could be prospective, prospective students, this could be faculty, this could be donors, this could be administrative users. Like we build a fake person that that fits one of those categories. So when we're coming up with that persona, Let's add a limitation to it. Simple lines such as, has red, green color blindness, which alters how they experience our design and that will help our designers think about how color plays a, a part on highlighting what's important on the page. Or maybe a persona of a, a alumni who has a broken wrist due to an accident. That's gonna change their mobility temporarily, but it's gonna change their mobility on how they can reach our donation page. Or maybe a parent who does most of their work well on the go, that's going to change how they're going to read the important information about our institutions and, and if it's something they want to help support their, their, their child go to. These three little sentences drastically change our personas and how they interact with our projects. And if we put these in here, then from our UX and our design, our core implementation of what we want to build through our developers to even giving it to our stakeholders will change how we implement our things and make us think about these differences and build for them from the beginning instead of tacking them on at the end. So if we do something such as create personas with limitations and we believe that no user is average, we're gonna start building for our users actual differences and we're gonna to get to know our users and build a better product to make a more positive impact on more of our users. Pillar number two, every user de deserves equal access. If we believe that every deserves equal access, we're going to throw out the notion that we know how users are interacting with our, our websites. We're going to know how they're downloading our content. We're going to throw out that idea that we understand where that, that user is. And we're going to recognize that based on where a user is located, based on the device they're using, is going to impact how they can connect with our information and that we have to build for that. Now, a recent study showed that for 2020, 41% of the internet browsing is from a desktop. I will admit that that number still seemed high to me in 2021. Uh, but what this tells us is that a majority of our users, 59% of our users, use a mobile or tablet device or a device we're not sure what sort of internet connection they have or their screen size or their resolution. A majority of our users, we can't account for that. And so if we can't account for how our users retrieve our content or in our information, we can at least control how we give it to them and make sure we're doing it in a way that works regardless of the device they're using. The one way we can really do this is make sure that all the content our WordPress sites output is structured in a way that makes sense. The one way to do this with HTML uh, is by using semantic markup. Semantic mark markup is the rule set around how HTML tags should be used and when they should be used. And if we follow these, we're going to get our T, regardless of the device that a user is consuming our content with. When we have an H1 on our page, it means it's an H1. It means it's a page title. And every 
internet device that uses a, a browser or consumes internet content, it's going to recognize that. The BBC, uh, you know, big, the big broadcasting company, they have an open source guide for how they identify their semantic markup from how an emphasis tag should be used, how H1 header should be used, and everything in between. That's open source that you can use. You can go to this bit.ly link, bit.ly, IDX, SEM, that's S-E-M, BBC, and read their semantic guidelines and start to think about well, what rules can you put in place for how you're going to use your tags uh, when your plugins are rendering content on your page? We can use progressive design to deliver experiences to our users. What this has to mean, and I, I apologize for any designers out there who may not like this statement, but we recognize that our designs are just there to highlight what's important to our users. So with that being said, if we use progressive design, what that means is we start with what's the minimum design we need to apply to our page to highlight what's important on that page to the user. And if we start with that bare minimum, if we start to make sure the minimum design delivered produces a, a positive experience, then as we recognize that a user has a beefier connection or that they're on a bigger device or they can have a retina display, that we can use tools and JavaScript and things like that to deliver a more enhanced design to, to add additional things to the page. But if we start from the bare minimum, what's the minimum design we need to do to make a positive um, impact to our users, then we can start from there. And finally, we can prioritize what needs to be loaded. Does our web page have to wait for that third party library to load? Does our web page need a retina image to load in the background to be useful to our users? If it does, we should think about, well, why? And then if it doesn't need to be relying on that, how can, can we defer those to be loaded on the page so that what needs to be loaded first, i.e. the content, gets to the user first and foremost and quickly. And then you know, through progressive design or, or other elements, we're adding these additional tools and libraries to our page to just improve our page experience. So if we structure in a way that makes sense and we understand that every user deserves equal access, then we are promoting what's most important and we're delivering what's most important to our users first and then adding additional after that so that every user gets that important information. Pillar number three, to provide understandable content to every user. If we believe that we should provide understandable content to every user, we are agreeing to a fundamental truth about the internet. And as developers, you may not like to hear this one, but you know, as developers, we are very proud of the plugins we write, of the code we produce, of the the you know the UX we come up with, and the patterns we implement, and the themes we design, we love to show them off. We have conferences where we talk about the tips and tricks and, and show off what we've built, and that's great. You know, it's very important, but it matters nothing to our users. Our users, every single one of them, care about one thing. And that's information. That's the only reason they come to our sites. That's the only reason they use our, our products is because they want to consume some sort of important content that's important to them. With that in mind, we want to make sure that our content is understandable to as many users as possible then because that's what they're there for. Every user that visits our site wants to read content. And so we need to provide content that's understandable to as many of those users as possible. So one of the ways we do this is by being clear and direct. You know, being clear and direct means avoiding jargon and using simple phrasing where we can. And when I talk about users, again, I'm not just talking about site visitors. I'm not talking about pr just prospective students or faculty or staff or, or parents or alumni. I'm talking about your content editors as well. When you're working on uh, controls for your WordPress theme or you're building a custom plugin to control some aspect of your WordPress site, what information are you providing to your editors to explain how to use the fields, how to fill in data, and what it does? Are you using developer-type language to explain how they're controlling a background image? Or, are you going to, or can you rephrase it in a simple way so that if they're not as technically minded, they understand it? Or when you're writing your user guides or, your, or um, your content editor guides, how can you provide simple phrasing to do that? We want to pay attention to our font, to our sp our word spacing, our letter spacing, and our line length. You know, if you're using a serif font, uh, or your your word and letter spacing are really small and compact, that's going to make it hard for anyone who has dyslexic issues from reading that content and understanding what's being written. But it's also going to affect someone who's on a small mobile device. It's going to be hard for them to read that. 
And then line length, you know, if we really condense our content and fill our pages with dense, dense content, there's a higher likelihood that a user is going to miss important information. The way users consume content on the web is by reading in what's known as an F pattern. So a user will read the first line of content, they'll read the second line of content, they'll read half the third line, half the fourth line, quarter of the fifth, they start to scan. So that means the more dense your content is, the more they're gonna scan it and the less they're going to consume and, and understand what's being written. So if we can use non-serif fonts, adequate letter and word spacing so that it's not as hard to read the words and then reduce the amount of lines of content and how close together they are. That's just going to relieve some of the mental strain our users have in reading our content and understanding what we're, we're telling them. Finally, we want to be meaningful with the content we provide and we can use tools to do things such as check the readability. What readability means is it assigns, it's an algorithm that assigns a score to your content to explain how difficult it is to read. And they do it in terms of grade levels. So the ideal is having content that's written in a, a sixth grade reading level. Now that doesn't mean that's an education level that a user needs to understand your content. What that means is the amount of uh, mental load it takes to understand what's being written. At a level sixth grade reading level, that puts the content in a place where people who are familiar with the concepts the content is talking about or people who are native speakers are still engaged with the content but they're not and they're not bored of it but it also provides uh, options for people who are not familiar with the the content in in the subject matter people who are not native speakers to that language that they can still read it and not get lost and and not feel dis discouraged from not understanding it and that goes back into using simple phrasing and jargon as well. One of the tools I like to use uh, for checking readability, and this is not the only one, there's a lot of them out there, is HemingwayApp.com. It's a website and an app you can download. Uh, this is not in any way a promotion for them. It's just the tool I personally like to use. What you can do uh, for this example with Hemingway App is you can copy your content, paste it in here, and it's going to run it through an algorithm to check the reading level and give you the readability score. It's going to highlight sentences that are hard to read, sentences that are really hard to read. It's going to highlight places that could have a simpler phrasing. This isn't going to solve all your content issues, but it's going to be helpful. And I like to use this again for like um, user guides for my editors. How I take everything that I write in Confluence and put it through this and see how can I simplify how to tell them how to use a widget, how to use a plugin, how to use a component um, in my pattern library. Finally, Provide every user with trust and respect. If we believe in providing every user with trust and respect, then just as with the last pillar, we understood that our users come to our sites for our content. Here we're understanding that when we request information from our users, trust is the hardest thing to acquire on the internet. And so that we need to do so, when we request information, we need to do so in a way that is that tells our users they can trust us with that information and that we respect the accuracy of their information and the information they provide us. When I was first learning about inclusive design, I first learned about it in this talk called Inclusive Design Excluding No Gender by Sarah Learin, who's a UX designer. And in her talk, she says, the easiest way to do inclusive design is to stop asking about gender. Now, what Sarah does is when she engages with a client and she finds a form on their website that has a question that asks for someone's gender, she stops and asks them, why are you collecting this information? What are you doing with it? And she says in her talk, most of the time, they say, well, we've just always collected it. And she says, stop doing it. And the reason for that is because, you know, if it's not being used, it's just a barrier to entry for your users to provide you accurate information. It's, it's just a, a barrier that you put in place that if you're not using it, it just muddles up the data. Now, if it is something you do need to use, if, if for Sarah's example, if you need to collect gender, she says, well, does it have to be a binary male or female? You know, people identify many different ways. How can we implement this in a way that opens it up so that people can provide us more accurate information? We can respect who they are as an individual. Now, how we can carry this away, how we can abstract this out for us to be inclusive, it's all about being responsible with user data. First and foremost, as Sarah's point indicates, is we need to have a reason for collecting the data. If you have a form that you're told to implement on your website, 
look through the information you're collecting and make sure you understand the reasons for collecting all of it. If you don't ask why, why are we collecting that proverbial gender question? Every single form field you put up for a, a user is a potential barrier that's going to stop someone from filling it out. You know, if, if you are trying to get emails for your, your institute newsletter, you probably just need an email field. You don't need a first name and a last name or all this other information. Like ask, why do you collect it? And if there's no good reason, ask if you don't need to collect it. And if there is a good reason, think about, well, how can we give the user control over what data they provide us? Now, when you are collecting data, be that cookies or form data, you need to explain how that data is going to be protected and how it's going to be used. You know, a user is not just going to hand you over their information if they don't understand what you're going to do to make sure it doesn't get leaked. We hear about these happening all the time, data leaks. So not only explain how the data is going to protect and make sure you have that on, on a privacy policy or a data usage page, but also make sure you're, you're actually implementing it. And finally, give users control of their data. Now, there are laws in place now where we have to do this. When I started giving this talk, it was just when GDPR was being released. Uh, but now we have GDPR, we have CCPA. That covers a lot of users. And so we need to make sure that users have control over their data, that they can see how we're collecting it, what we collected, give them access to edit it and remove it. And this goes back to pillar one. If you give users ability to keep their data up to date and to provide as accurate information as possible, they're probably going to do it. And that is going to help you better understand who your end users are. And from there, going back to, again, to pillar one, that you can use that to refine what you're building to reach actual users and not average users. So if you give users control of their data, you're going to show that you trust them to give you accurate information. You're going to show them that you trust them to only give them your inform give you their information if they want you to, to see it. And then you're going to show them, hey, we protect this information in these ways. And, you know, again, if you're only collecting the data you need, you probably don't need much data. And so there's less you have to worry about protecting and, and less you're liable for. So if we're, we'd be responsible for our data, then we're going to give our users uh, trust and respect that they need to share it with us. And that's going to improve the experience for everybody. Now, this is not one of the pillars, but I just want to take a moment and talk about taking ownership as a developer. Now, if you know you work with WordPress, you work with a higher ed institution, there's probably many layers and many other people involved with the work that you produce that gets out on the web. And you don't always have control about what gets out there and how it gets implemented. You know, there are times when you just take the task you need to have and you need to put it out there because the dean says so or, you know, or whatnot. But it's your responsibility as a developer to take ownership, to be the subject matter expert, to ask these questions and to push these ideas. Because if someone says, we want to throw up this form that collects all this information from the user, if you don't ask, well, why do we need to collect this information? You're responsible for that barrier. You're responsible for making it harder for those users and you're not providing that positive experience for those users. Take ownership, ask those questions, be the subject matter expert, work with your teams to build something better, to make a bigger positive impact. It's up to you as a developer to take ownership of these things, to take ownership of how you reach your users, how you deliver content to your users, regardless of your role as a developer in your institution. You were hired because you're the subject matter expert. So raise those points, ask those questions. So again, these are my four pillars of inclusive, having an inclusive mindset. I hope you can use them on your next project or your next piece of functionality. Again, they are no user is average. Every user deserves equal access to provide undersmell content for every user. And every user deserves our trust and respect. I'm hoping you're nodding your head and you've agreed with at least one of these points and that you can carry it forward with your team and start doing it. I believe in these so much so that back when I first came up with these, I slapped a Creative Commons 4.0 open source license on them. So feel free to take these four pillars, use them however you want to. Uh, to improve your process, your team's process, to promote them however you want. And going back to uh, providing understandable content for every user, you know, simple phrasing, avoid jargon. There's a lot of content here I can take out of these. I'll make it simple for you. It boils down to this. No average, equal access, understandable content, trust and respect. As WordPress developers, if we can do this for our users every day, what are we going to do? We're going to make a positive impact on as many people as possible for our institutions.
So with that, that's my talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I have a number of resources here that I'd like to share with you. This presentation, an annotated version of it, is available at this bit.ly link. That's bit.ly slash IDX WPC21. Todd Rose's talk, The Myth of Average, is available at bit.ly slash IDX AVG MYTH. That's Average Myth. The BBC Semantic Guidelines you can find at bit.ly slash IDX SEM BBC. Uh, Sarah Lahren's talk, Inclusive Design, Excluding No Gender, is available at bit.ly slash IDX Gender. And I didn't talk about this during the talk, but it's a great resource. There's a book called Inclusive Design Patterns, which shows you uh, for uh, using for HTML and CSS how to implement things in an inclusive way from carousels to slideshows to navigation elements to quotes and in, in other like photo galleries, everything you could think of that you want to implement on a website. They pretty much have inclusive design for it. So I'd find that at bit.ly slash IDX patterns. Check out that book. It's a really great use, resource. With that, I want to thank you again for taking the time to listen to me. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've taken something away. If you have additional questions or comments about this subject or anything related to web development in general uh, in higher ed, please reach out. Again, my handle is MikeMiles86 pretty much everywhere. Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, GitHub, I don't know, YouTube. Uh, I don't know where else. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and comments.